that's the first time and maybe the last time Steve Jobs' name and mine will ever be mentioned together. So I'll have to remember this. So thanks for being here. This is a great uh, opportunity for me to share some of our thinking and the path that we're on to solve some of these greatest challenges. How can we break down barriers between people that exist today? Um, this is a program we started in Bell Labs uh, less than a year ago, so it's relatively new. And I've tried to put together all of our thinking and our doing in this in a somewhat coherent manner. And I'd really appreciate feedback on this. So after the talk, please come and find me and let's have a conversation and share ideas on how we can solve some of these problems together. So what is this problem? Um, so this is something that I'm really kind of obsessed by and it frustrates me. How is it possible that almost 50 years ago, we put people on the moon with computational power, a fraction of what I have in my pocket. And yet today we have all of these barriers between people, culture, race, religion, and politics. That is very odd to me. So there's reasons from an evolutionary point of view that people can speak to why all these barriers exist. But from an evolutionary point of view, we were never meant to go to the moon. And yet we broke that barrier and we achieved that because we came together and we wanted to solve a big goal together. So why is it that from a humanity point of view today, we have all these barriers. Why is there still today, with all of our technological advancement, all of this weird stuff that's going on in the world? If you think about that, this is something that I think about quite a lot when we think about in Bell Labs. And this is the core problem that we are trying to solve in our mission in Bell Labs and why we are collaborating with the artistic and the creative communities to try and come up with approaches with the human at the center to break down these barriers. So this is the major challenge. And when I talk about our goal, Solving this problem is one of the biggest things we're working towards at the moment, and everything I show you in this talk will be towards that. So here's another thing that I think about a lot as well. I think about it in the world today, and each of you must experience this quite frequently, and I can give you an example from my own experience. The power of a negative thing, a statement, a, an action, is far more powerful than a positive thing. And again, you can think of it in evolutionary terms, we were, came into this world and we evolved so that we look out for the threats and the issues and the negatives so that we can uh, maintain our survival. But again, just because it's an evolutionary reason that we've got to that point doesn't mean we have to stay there today. So why is it that this is happening today in the world? Why is everything you ever hear pretty much negative? Why does the negative overpower the positive? And the real challenge here then is, if the negative is at least an order of magnitude more powerful than the positive message, then just to have parity, we need to have an order of magnitude more positivity in the world, just to have parity. But surely we shouldn't accept parity between negative and positive. We would like the positive to completely squash the negative. We would like humanity to be far more positive in the whole. That now means that we have to amplify the positive signals by many orders of magnitude more than the negative signals. And we are so far from that in the current state of affairs in the world today that this is quite unimaginable. But why shouldn't we do this? Why wouldn't this be a good thing to do? And what are the approaches we can take to amplify these positive signals, to remove the negatives, and to break down these barriers between people? And another major, and I could go on all day just talking about issues in the world and challenges and how we should all solve these together, but just on the last one, this concept of digital loneliness. So we, as from a history of humanity, we have never been as connected as we are today via technology. And yet the levels of loneliness and depression and isolation are skyrocketing. So technology has enabled all of this connection, but humanity has replaced physical, a physical social network for a digital social network. And in the process, we've gone down a kind of weird path how now our interactions are based on how many likes you have on a web interface and how many people view a particular link you post. And I just constantly am reminded every day by how weird this is. Think about this where we are today. All I ever see people do is this. This is the new motion of humanity, constantly just flicking through whatever social media platform you happen to be engaged on. So we've developed all this immense technology. We've connected people in ways that we never could have imagined. And what do we do with it? Thumb scroll constantly. So there's something seriously wrong with all of this in general. This is not helping humanity. It's actually causing us to go in the opposite direction, in my opinion. And these are some of the things that we now need to be very conscious of, but we need to be even more conscious of them because of the pace of evolution of this technology and how people are being more interconnected. And these tensions, the tensions between the physical and the digital, 
and the tensions in your future digital self, when everything is digitized, these tensions are going to cause us, from a human point of view, um, severe issues in the future. And we need to start thinking about them now and how we develop our technology. And working with the artistic community is one of the uh, key ways, in our opinion, to do this. Okay, so give you a little bit of background. Why in Bell Labs do we work on these things? Why do we even have a right to play in this space? And I'll try and give a little bit of context. So Bell Labs has a very strong his a scientific history for many, many decades, eight Nobel Prizes and every scientific uh, achievement you could imagine, and it's well known for all of that. But we also have a very strong history in how we collaborate with the creative community, going back many decades. So a couple of examples. Um, in the 1930s, we collaborated with a very famous conductor called Leopold Sterkowski. Uh, we had the first stereo transmission of sound, and we did lots of other interesting things then. In the 50s and 60s, we had artists in residence like Lillian Swartz, who developed the first computer-aided art and uh, design and graphics. Um, and that pioneered the early everything digital, all 2D animation, 3D animation back in those days. And we had artists in residence many decades ago before they, it became a very popular thing nowadays. And then in the 60s, there was a couple of Bell Labs engineers that had collaborations with the likes of artists like Rauschenberg, Cage, and Whitman, these very famous artists of the day. And they infused the technology from Bell Labs, the research from Bell Labs, into the creative practice uh, of these artists. And the combination of both those things was seen to be uh, spectacular and powerful and changed the way both the engineer and the artist thought and um, did their work. And this spawned a whole movement then called EAT, Experiments in Arts and Technology. So I'll refer to EAT a couple of times as an acronym, and um, that's what it stands for. And this had a whole movement in many chapters globally all around the world where engineers and scientists collaborated with artists. And this was a very inspirational movement, and still to this day it has inspired lots of artists and technologists to collaborate. That particular movement kind of fizzled away, it lost its energy in the 80s, um, and Bell Labs and the EAT organization kind of became a little bit um, distant from each other for whatever reason. And more recently, uh, last year, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of this famous nine evenings of performances where the engineers and the artists came together. And we realized through the conversations that we really lost out as an organization by not continuing those interactions today because there's a wealth of knowledge and insight and uh, thinking and the ability in their creative practice to change how we would think about technology. And this is very important. So I have to give a description. We have a bunch of engineers and scientists in Bell Labs. And typically, a trained engineer or scientist is very reductionist in their approach. So we start with something that's very big. We break it up into its individual units. And we go to the smallest level, and we solve that. And then we put our blinkers on, and we can't see out that, outside that problem that we're trying to solve. And we're very linear in our approach. That's what happens through our training. And that's fine. We can solve technological challenges there. Now, the artist is exactly the opposite. They're very divergent in their thinking. They start with something that's very small, and this becomes a full 360 universe in itself. And they're very lateral in their thinking. So this is a quite an interesting juxtaposition between the artist's mindset and approach to the engineers. And bringing the two of them together and colliding them purposefully is a very powerful thing. This started way back when, and we've decided to reinvigorate and re-energize that today. So to give you some visual sense of um, what we're talking about doing, and I'll give you real examples, we are looking at enabling virtual teleportation, and we want to transfer a sense of empathic state or emotional state between people, again, to break down these barriers that exist. And we kind of joke about this in the Star Trek terms. Star Trek got a lot of things correct, but we think they got teleportation wrong. Why would you physically disintegrate a body and then physically reintegrate the body somewhere else? so that the people can be in proximity, why wouldn't you just transmit information between people at a distance, but encode that information with emotion and sentiment and cognition and empathy and these kind of things to build that deeper connection? So that's the kind of um, the thinking we're at, and this is the approach we're taking. So some of the things that drive our thinking in this is, again, to put the human at the center at all times, and working with the artistic community helps do this. So this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's a reasonable framework to think about most human things. And what we would like to do in general from a human point of view, and, it, and think about this, this can be AI or robotics or artistic things, but we would like to spend less time at the base of the pyramid 
so that we have more time at the top of the pyramid to be more creative, to self-actualize, and then to help others become the best that they can be as well. And the more time we spend at the base of the pyramid, the less time we have at the upper echelons. And for this reason, until we manage to get to those upper echelons, humanity will not reach its full potential. So a lot of the work we're doing is to save time um, so you don't have to spend time at the bottom of the pyramid and to create time so we can be more creative and we can figure out better ways for humans to interact and communicate. So what we are doing at a high level, and I'll, I'll go into specifics, we're creating a solution to enable this transfer of emotion or empathy. And I would ask you, don't get too particular about the words, it, whether it's empathy or compassion or emotion or experience. The point is that we want to go beyond how we communicate today. And it could be a combination of all of those things or it could be just one of them. But we want to bring all of these things together and be able to share at a distance over technology uh, this connection between people that you don't have today. You only have it today when you engage in proximity in physical presence. And what we want to do is we're going to develop technology to create a, a sixth sense so that we can augment our senses and that we can break down these barriers that we mentioned before between people, race, culture, politics, and so on. And if you think about it, this is a little bit crazy. Physiologically and biologically and psychologically, for the most part, um, everyone in the world is basically the same. All right, there are very few differences between the majority of us from a human holistic point of view, yet look at all of the weird, crazy stuff that's going on on the planet today. Why is that? So there's something that's broken down between how we communicate as people or races or cultures, and there's a disconnect and there's a lack of translation and a lack of calibration. And we think by creating this sixth sense and by augmenting your senses, we can help bridge that gap. And that's some of the things I'm going to talk to you about now. So how are we um, going about this? What are the particular specific things we are working on to try and break down these barriers? So if you think about it today, how, I'm, how I'm, I am communicating with you is exceptionally limited. So I have my spoken word, um, which is highly uh, reliant on my ability to be a good speaker. And I have my written word on the slides. And we have some kind of uh, auditory communication and we have a visual communication. But I'm not really sharing any more than that. That's exceptionally limited. And from a human point of view, we've evolved to the point where this has become our only mode of communicating, and it's exceptionally limited from a, an emotional, empathic point of view. And this is a visual example of what we've managed to achieve from a human point of view for communication. We have very basic text characters, we have emojis, and we've basically, this is how we communicate now, right? It's through, through a chat interface, no sense of emotion, no sense of empathy. We've broken down the magical language that we use to maybe 140 characters on Twitter or a very short text message. And this is moving us in the exact opposite direction to where we should be going as people. We should be having more connection and more sharing, and this is the wrong approach in our uh, minds. So this is some of the things we think about in Bell Labs and when we work with the artist communities to ask these questions. How will we communicate in the future? Are there better means and modes of communication? And how can we then fuse our technology with these creative thinkings and these philosophies to build a better connection between people? So we also think about the fact, if we want to share emotions, well, what are reasonable ways to think about doing that? So if you think of it, music is like a universal structure or framework, or you could consider it as a kind of language. And there's this great ability in music to be able to share emotions. And you can share emotions with any person across the world at distance at any time, and they can get a sense of that emotion, and they do not need to be trained as a musician to appreciate that. So there's something very special in the structures of music and sound and how our brain processes that, that we would want to tap into. How can we use those structures and frameworks and that thinking and music to encode information in a certain way between people so we can add emotion and empathy to it? So that's some of the things. So we work with a lot of musicians, a lot of composers, a lot of artists that fuse technology and music and composition to try and figure and decode how can you add emotion into how we communicate as people. So how could I actually transmit emotion to you now as I'm speaking? So instead of me telling you I'm frustrated by how messed up the world is, I could actually transmit a signal to you where you'd really feel it and then we would have a deeper bond and a deeper connection because now you would feel that rather than you trying to interpret my words and my body language where I'm trying to give a sense of how frustrated I am by how messed up things are. 
We also work on haptics and spatial audio, and we call these uh, chains of persuasion. So this is very important. Everyone is talking about VR, virtual reality, and augmented reality, and mixed reality, and all these things. And they will definitely be extremely important in the future for how we interact as humans. But the key thing is today, your mind fights VR because it doesn't believe it's real. And everyone is trying to make VR as realistic as we are here today. And that's probably the wrong approach. It's maybe unachievable. And also, unless it's perfect, your mind is just going to fight it. And that's why people get quite nauseated when they experience VR. But if you add in your other senses and just a couple of small elements of your other senses, like your haptic, your touch sense, and your um, auditory sense, and you add in spatial audio and a couple of these minor cues into the VR or the AR, all of a sudden your brain fills in the gaps and it thinks that this is real. And it's really happy then with the experience. And you can leverage the brain's ability to fill in these gaps to make that a much better experience. So again, we're working on things like haptic and spatial audio to act as these additional chains of persuasion to make sure that when we as humans all interface and communicate over AR and VR in the future, that we're not nauseated by it, that we don't reduce it to emojis and text like we've done with our written modes of communication, but it actually helps us engage more socially and we can share empathy and emotion and these kind of things. We also work on areas like um, extrasensory perception, and we talk about sensor fusion. So today what happens is most people have a sensor that does a particular task, another sensor that does a particular task, and so on. And there's very little value in the information that you get from each of those sensors on their own. But when you combine all that information, that becomes highly valuable. Then you can run that through some kind of augmented intelligence. Uh, we have an augmented intelligence similarity engine that we developed in Bell Labs. And that can combine all this information and show you how some information or some people are more similar or dissimilar to what you would have thought otherwise. So now we can start using sensor fusion, breaking down that big data to small data to prove to people that you are more like someone that you might have thought otherwise through the way you perceive the world not to be like. And we hope to break down these barriers again between people and race and culture and religion and politics, all of these things, by proving to people that you're actually exactly like that person on the divide of that political issue or whatever. Um, and this is very important. So again, you can think about how we can use technology for the good to break down these barriers, not to use it in the way we currently are, which I'll go back to is basically thumb scrolling cat videos on Facebook or whatever. So think about it. It's quite disappointing that we've evolved to that point from a human point of view. We've gone to the moon, and yet we communicate through thumb scrolling cat videos. That's meant to be funny. but. <laughs> Um, and then we also think about sensorless sensing. So how can you move into a space, interact in an environment like this, and not need a smartphone, not need a wearable device, not need hundreds of sensors on your body, but how can the environment actually sense you and then help you interrelate with the environment and the people within it in a very positive way, again, to build these deeper connections. So I, I'm going to give you a few examples of the type of artistic collaborations that we have ongoing just this year. Um, and then I'm going to show you real examples of some of the work we're doing to give you a sense of how we're on this path. And I'll stress again, we've really just started this earlier in the year. Uh, we're on this journey, and I'll give you examples, but we're nowhere near having a solution. And it's going to take a lot more work and a lot more conversations with people in this audience to figure out what is the right approach. So if I just uh, talk through them briefly, I'll point here um, on the screen. So this is an artist called Beatty Wolf. She's a British singer-songwriter, and she is always looking to infuse technology into her art form in a way that will build a deeper connection with her audience and her listeners. So on this particular project in May, we launched an album with BT, and the premise of the album was she wanted to go back to the physicality and the tangibility and the ceremony of back in the day when you used to open an album sleeve and you would read the sleeve notes, and the sleeve notes were from the artist, and you would look at the pictures that the artist put in the sleeve notes, and you'd have the words of the song, and then you would listen to the record, and you would combine that with the sleeve notes, and you had this much deeper connection to the artist. Think about what's happened today. I love Spotify, by the way, it's a great uh, tool, but think about what happens today. You have highly compressed sound, and you have zero connection to the artist, other than what you hear. So the idea here was how could you bring that sense of physicality, tangibility, and ceremony that you used to have way back when into the modern streamed digital age and to build a deeper connection between people and you can almost share emotions in that way. So this is what we worked on. 
We developed a lot of technology in this. I won't go into it in too much detail. But what we ended up doing was being able to present to the audience um, the visual of the song that was in the artist's head so that as an audience member through AR and VR, when you listen to the song, you were actually immersed in her mind and how she visualizes that song, how she thought about the song, the words of the songs. And it was a full 360 landscape. And when you sat within this virtual world with the right cues and with the right audio and the right approach done subtly, everyone that experiences this says, I feel a much deeper connection to the artist. And that was a good step for us to be able to show that with the right approach to technology, the right combination of technologies, we can start breaking down some of these barriers and building deeper connections. If I look at this one here, um, this is an artist called Su Gwen Chung, and she does really interesting work on collaborating with robots. And if you think about this, the future, no matter what your thoughts are, we will have more robotics uh, in our lives to help us automate everything. Again, the reason we would want to automate everything is so that we spend less time at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy. So our world is going to collide with robotics in a very strong way. They're going to become more and more of how we exist as humans, how we interact as humans, and how we interact with robots is very important. So we work with Su Gwen to understand uh, in a symbiotic way how you can collaborate with a robot. And what are the advantages you get from having this hybrid symbiotic collaboration between a person and a robot? So we don't think about robots taking over the world. We think that is a load of nonsense, to be honest with you. We think about how can we work together with robots so we uh, get more out of that and it's more symbiotic and collaborative approach. Um, this artist here is a Belgian artist called Jasna Rock, and she's in the fashion tech area. And she measures her brainwave activity, and she's developed a sentient garment. And she measures her brainwave activity, so when she's in an environment and if she feels stressed or frustrated or um, anxious, the brainwave monitor will pick that up. And in this particular case, what happens is her dress, her sentient garment, builds a cocoon around her head to protect her from this stressful environment that she's exposed to. Now, you might think that's crazy. Who will walk through life with a sentient garment that builds a cocoon around their head? Well, I'm not sure. It might become a thing, it might not. But the thing is, the reason we work with her is because she thinks deeply about those kind of things. How do you protect a person in a stressful environment? How do you detect the mood of a room or the mood of a person? How do you connect the one-to-one -one and the one-to-many and so on? And, and how do you expose this kind of uh, technology to augment and help the person have a better interaction with other people? And let me just maybe finish with one, and then I can go on to some examples. Or I'll maybe do two more. So on the top left is an artist called Lisa Park. And she does a lot of biofeedback measurements and physiological measurements on the body. And Lisa puts people into different circumstances in couples. And she understands the dynamic and the interaction between people in different scenarios and environments. And then she measures their physiological response. And then what she does is she makes visible those completely invisible signals and interactions between people by either sonifying the interaction, so making music of it or visualizing it in different ways. And if you think about our goal to create this new language of empathic communication and to share emotions between people, you can see why we, we would want to work with a person like that, to understand these connections between people and be able to expose those connections in a way that you can understand and make sense of. And then the one on the very top right is a group called Hammerstep. Uh, they're a dance group, but again, they're extremely interested to explore how dance and physical movement acts as a mode of communication between people. And if you think about this way back when, before we had the written word and the spoken word, humans communicated in forms of physical movement. And um, from a musical point of view, there's theories that we possibly communicated via music and sound before we ever had the, the uh, written word. So there's something deep there within the processing of the brain and how humans evolved that we could look to leverage in physical movement, um, auditory processing, all these kind of things to try and add it to how we communicate today as humans so that we can add emotion and empathy and all of these kind of things into how we interact. Okay, so that's some examples of uh, where we are in our collaborations today. So I'm going to give you some examples. Um, these are fairly basic, but I want to give you a sense of how you could consider using technology to augment your senses expose the signals that are typically invisible to us, because if you think about it as humans, our perception of the world around us is very limited. We only perceive a tiny, tiny fraction of everything that goes around us, and we're trying to consider if we can augment our senses 
using technology in the right way, how can we expose some of these hidden signals and then how can we use that to build deeper connections between people? So one example is, um, I'm not gonna talk about the technology too much, but we developed very advanced video algorithms and analytics techniques that we apply in very complicated smart city environments. Um, and what we decided was to push the limits of the technology and to see if it had value beyond a smart city. What happens if you turn those algorithms on the natural world around us? Could we expose hidden patterns and hidden signals that are completely invisible to us because of how we perceive the world as humans? So one of the first ones we did for fun was we turned the video algorithms on fish swimming in a fish tank and we wanted to see were there hidden patterns there that we are blind to as humans. So I'm gonna give you a listen to that and then I'll explain how we actually went about achieving this. Okay, so you get the point. The resolution wasn't great on the video, but that wasn't bad. We were shocked at how reasonably good the musicality of the fish swimming in a fish tank was. Um, and you might be wondering, what is this guy on about? What does this have to do with anything? But the point is, if I just showed you the fish swimming in the fish tank without music, all you would have seen was some fish randomly moving around. But we don't realize as humans that there's actually hidden signals there, there's latent and inherent patterns, and there's this invisible signaling that's going on that we have no idea about because how we're limited and how we perceive the world. So how can we use technology to expose those signals and make visible those invisible signals? So that's what we did here, very basically. It's a very simple example. All we did was very little manipulation because we could have made that sound better by really manipulating it. All we did is we interrogated this scene this fish swimming in the fish tank. We split it into a number of squares, like you see here. We attributed a couple of instruments to different squares randomly. And then within that, we said the density of fish gives octave, the direction of the fish gives note, and the velocity of the fish gives tempo. And we did nothing else. And we just said, well, let's just hear or see what this sounds like, if that even makes sense. And it was quite interesting to us. So then we were thinking, OK, there's something here our limited perception of the world is um, holding us back. How can we think about augmenting our senses and leveraging the fact that all of this is going on in nature around us, and how can we use technology to enable that? So I'll give you um, another example. My background is working on turbulence in airflow and fluid flow, so it's a bit of a historical passion for me. But we were wondering, how can we understand exceptionally complex systems or signals like you have in turbulence um, without having to use a supercomputer to analyze them. So what happens today in turbulence, it's so complicated, it's so chaotic, you have to run a supercomputer for about six or eight months just to solve the most basic turbulence problem. So it's computationally exceptionally difficult and expensive, and it takes us a lot of time just to work through these problems. So the idea here is, could we analyze those signals in a different way? Could we augment our senses of turbulence as humans? We have no idea how to perceive turbulence, other than when you're in a plane, obviously, you get physical movement, which is one. But in a, in a fluid flow point of view, how do we break down these patterns? So what we did was we applied certain techniques to turbulence, and we wanted to sonify the turbulence signal. So we wanted to make music out of the turbulence signal to see if there was patterns there that we could determine as humans, because we are very good at understanding the structure in music, that then when we sonify the turbulence signals, it might help us be able to understand them in a better way, in a more easily interpreted human way. So this is a sliding bubble. It's moving through a liquid. The turbulence structures are what you see coming off the back here. Uh, these generate, these are very chaotic. Um, the, all those structures are what causes drag on an airplane or drag on a golf ball or these kind of things. Um, and it's quite interesting. So it takes all different shapes and sizes. And what we wanted to do then was to analyze this with machine vision and then see if we could sonify this and listen to those structures and those patterns. And then determine, will we be better at analyzing turbulence through sound rather than using a supercomputer for eight months to run a simple solution? So we're gonna hear it now.
Okay. So again, it's not the best music you'll ever hear, but it's not the worst either. But it's interesting that now we can sonify those exceptionally complicated structures and signals within turbulence, and you can immediately start understanding some of the patterns in something that would be imperceivable to you otherwise. So again, we're making visible these invisible signals, and how can we use that then to build better connections between people and break down barriers? And I'll show you another example. So we worked, the most recent collaboration we had was, was with an artist in Ireland called Philip King. And we created a piece called Creating Sonic Empathy to Augment the Spoken Word. So the idea was, when you typically have a poet that is delivering a poem or orating a poem, they're using the spoken word, which is, as we mentioned, reasonably limited in sharing emotion. Um, and typically the poet stands quite still and static. And you get the verbal, you get the words, and you don't really get too much more than that, unless the words in particular happen to resonate with you. Um, but there's only a small amount of people that resonate with a particular word in a particular poem. So it's reasonably limited in its ability to share emotion between people when you're um, orating a poem. So we worked with Philip on using the same machine vision video analytics techniques to interrogate his movement on the stage as he delivered the poem. And we wanted, with Philip, to create this new um, scale, a new language of music, so that as he moved, and you'll see this on the video, as he moved his arm and his fingers and his hand through this interrogation re region, as he delivered the poem, we added a sonic response to that that was meant to share emotions. And it's real-time live. It's not pre-recorded or anything. And he is moving his body to create this sonic landscape to deliver emotion on top of his spoken word. So I'm going to play a video, and you'll get a sense of that. Um, and this will be the last example we'll show on this path that we're on to augment our senses and break down these barriers between people. This first um, piece that I'm going to speak for you is very, very, very appropriate to this experiment. And here's a very strange thing. This poem was written in the 13th century. Uh, it was written by uh, a Persian poet um, whose name was Rumi, Jalaluddin Rumi. And it's called Where Everything is Music. And it's so appropriate. It could almost have been, I suppose, commissioned to be written as part of this experiment. So here we go. Um, it's my first venture into experiment science. <laughs> right, OK. Where everything is music. Don't worry about saving these songs. And if one of our instruments breaks, it doesn't matter. We have fallen into the place where everything is music. The strumming and the flute notes rise into the atmosphere. And even if the whole world's harp should burn up, there will still be hidden instruments playing. So the candle flickers and goes out. We have a piece of flint and a spark. This singing art is sea foam. The graceful movements come from a pearl somewhere on the ocean floor. The poems reach up like spindrift along the beach wanting. They derive from a slow and powerful root that we can't see. So, stop the words now. Open the window in the center of your chest and let the spirits fly in. Okay, so I hope you get a sense of how you could add emotion to something that typically wouldn't have had emotion associated with it. And we used technology to track the artist's movement, and he controlled that sound real time to be able to externalize what he was feeling internal about how he uh, was emotional and thought about that poem. So that's a, this is just a, a kind of a simple or an artistic example but I hope you can see that we, could sh we should start exposing these hidden signals that exist in the world. We should use technology to augment our senses. 
and we should make visible these invisible signals, and in the process we will learn how to be able to interact better between humans and share empathy and emotion and all these kind of things. So just to wrap up, um, as we mentioned, we are fusing uh, technology and the arts, and what we want to do is to be able to automate everything at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy so we have more time to be better as humans at the top of the hierarchy, and we will be more creative in the process. We want to come up with approaches to amplify the positive signals by many, many orders of magnitude so we can completely annihilate and squash the negative signals, because there's far too much in the world today. We talked about that a little bit. Um, and just to, to finish off then, to think about this, as I mentioned, how is it possible that we could break our evolutionary barriers, send people to the moon almost 50 years ago, the 50th anniversary will be in 2019, with computational power, a fraction of what I have in my pocket, and yet today there's all this messed up stuff that's going on in the world. I mean, it's absolutely crazy if you think about how far we've come as humans, so much technological advancement, but we have not applied it in the right way to how humans interact and humans communicate. And I would like for you please to come and talk with me now or later in the day and share your ideas and thinking on this. And we should all together try and figure out how we amplify those positive signals. So thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, time flies when you listen to such a creative mind. Thank you very much, uh, Dunal. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're going to have a lunch break uh, soon. Uh, but before uh, we all leave uh, to lunch break, uh, let me remind you to share whatever happens here in your social media uh, with hashtags Master Robots and hashtag Singularity U Warsaw. Um, uh, one more information, those of you who purchase uh, lunch with the ticket should have picked uh, up vouchers along with the bench today. If you didn't get the voucher up front, don't worry, uh, there are several food trucks uh, around, so I hope that you will be all right. All through, I hope to see you come after the break.